anyone back yet? Rich is back. Christina's here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Again, it's hard to see the uh, phone noise come out to tell who's talking, but I got four people here. Any questions before we move on? Again, you learn from doing. I'm flipping through the slides in this module quickly. Some of you have already probably installed SLES before, and it should be review. But I do not want to take the time to actually demo an installation since it takes time for the install and stuff. I'll just do a demo to get it started and then let somebody else take over from there. Again, in an SMN, with the SGI Management Center, you will not be installing from SLES Media. You'll be installing from the SGI Management Center, formerly called IELT. And it's a whole different process there. So there's another class that deals with how to build payloads and images and actually provision UVs. But I don't want that complication in this class. So this is just a quick SLES 11 installation. So we want to list the uh, root drive required partitions and their types. Now, we've got some politics here because uh, engineering and manufacturing are shipping with extended three roots, not XFS roots. And maybe your customer wants to actually run an XFS route. I'll explain the, the reasons for that later in the week. So the lab is kind of written to be close to the way manufacturing is shipping, not necessarily uh, the best way. So your root partition layout may be different than what SMN, SMC is going to do, and it may be different than what manufacturing is going to do. For example, with an SMC, there is no FAT slash boot file system because it pixie boots. Then we want to establish console connection, which you should be able to do by now, hopefully during break. It sounds like you were logging in through SSH, but I just want to be sure you can get into the serial connection. Again, I only use the serial connection for boots, installs, shutdowns. Once I've got a normal network connection, I would normally use SSH. It's going to be better performing and stuff, too. So we're going to install SLES 11 SP1, and then install the foundation software, and then install the performance suite software. Now, personally, I like to install SLES without any add-on products and to get my core installation done as quickly and cleanly as possible. If I were to add in ISSP or foundation or something, it might get more complicated and break it. If I were to actually be generating an AutoYAS file, then I would try to do it all at once. But in this class, I'm doing it in stages. So we will install SLES and then reboot, go through first boot, and then after we've got SLES installed, then we're going to install SGI software. Should you want to try it all at once, that's your choice. But the lab is not written that way right now. In fact, the, the lab is actually written three different ways. There's the one that is in the lecture portion, and then there's the one that is in the lab portion, and they are doing it differently. And I'm actually working on a third way of doing it. So uh, adjust as you need for your type of background. So by default, SUSE is using extended three as your default root file system type. Uh, that is the default that is being shipped from engineering. Basically, they want to ship what they're running, and they've been running Extended 3 as their root. Right now, there are no plans to switch to an XFS root to ship from. There is an RFE on this, but there are no plans to do anything. Uh, the installer must understand your PROM and your BIOS. You generally want to get your PROM and your BIOS uh, current. 
Uh, I'll give you a URL where you can go off or support for telling you what the latest firmware is. Let me save that for tomorrow. And again, UV1000s use the SMC to do the install. So software-wise, we have SLES or we have Red Hat. Now, not all of the performance suite is in Red Hat. So there are some things that are uh, SLES specific within the performance suite software. Then we have our foundation software. Now, the foundation software may change over over releases, but it would possibly have device driver libraries. For a while there, we had uh, uh, InfiniBand drivers and stuff like that. It has LSI util, memory logging utilities, the memlog stuff. Performance Copilot is mostly on the foundation CD. Now, there is one proprietary package, but uh, we're, we're going to talk about that later. ESP support tools, the licensing lock daemon, and a thing called HWPerf that uh, during boot creates the slash proc uh, UV type stuff to be able to identify this as a UV system and for the topology command to work. Now, uh, still not sure about all of this, but the other RPM, the other ISO product distribution should be able to load without the foundation but I am in the habit of loading foundation no matter what. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was loading the infinite storage software product, ISSP, and uh, it did not require SFS at the time, but a week ago, they made the decision to actually require the foundation software with ISSP. So again, I'm just in the habit of loading this stuff. Mostly, I want PCP, but there are other things that are in there as well. Also, for your information, if you are loading, installing ISSP, and you're trying to do the foundation as an add-on product during an auto yast, I have a PV because PCP storage will hang. So you cannot install PCP storage on your first install. It's actually trying to start up network services to hosts that aren't there yet. The networking isn't in place yet. So that's just another reason why I like to install SLES first, get a system up and boot it, and then put the layers on top. Okay? So I personally always load foundation because I want PCP. Then we've got uh, the performance suite. Again, ProPack has been broken up into pieces to be able to price them separately. And those that are only a runtime environment don't need uh, debugging tools or things like that. But basically, most sites are still going to need the SGI MPI and SGI Accelerate distributions. And then we also have React, which is the real time. And then U UPC, the Unified Parallel C. And there is also an XVM ISO that I have for standalone, or you might be getting it out of the ISSP distribution. Now, this ISO that I've got, this XVM 6.2 ISO, does not have the XVM GUIs in it. There's no XVM MGR in it. Just the XVM commands, the PCP, and the kernel modules. Any questions? Once you've got them loaded, you'll be able to see what they are. Well, one thing I did miss, Perf Boost is a new product to be able to take an Intel or an HP or a MBAT pitch MPI application, intercept the MPI calls, and call SGI's MPT instead. There's also an SGI no, that should be, I'm sorry, that should be PCP-SGI. That's still typed wrong. PCP-SGI is proprietary SGI software, like uh, getting to UV metrics. So there's a couple unique things that are not in the open source version. I'll come back to that later. Any questions? 
So our install sources, we are going to be doing, we're going to install SLES from a file system tree that's NFS mounted, and then we're going to install ProPack and SDKs and stuff from ISOs. So the next class, the UVSA2 or the uh, UVSMC-V class, install using the Clusterworks IL SGI Management Center product. And in that case, everything is on the SMN. So you have a YUM repository and a, pr a product manager management called SMT. SMT, Subscription Management Tool, that we used on ICE and Tempo as well. So basically, we download the repository from Novell with SMT mirror credentials, put that SMT repository under YUM control with Creepo, and then with the uh, management center, use that repository as our payload to build our images from. And then when we're building UVs, the UVs should be pointing to that YUM repository that's on the SMN. But we're not doing it that way in this class. Now, there are people, like in the last classes, that have been doing installs from DVD. Uh, there has been uh, complications trying to get the DVD recognized, a USB DVD recognized on boot. But people seem to get past that. It will work. And then we can also install from network. Now, HTTP as a network source gives me authentication control. FTP, very few people use. Uh, web server for updates. What we have is we're going to say NFS. We're going to NFS mount the DMZ server. Now, you have to be careful. The, the labs that the other instructor had done mounted ISOs. But YAST will do that for you. You just have to point to the server and point to the ISO. So I'm trying to clean up and make it simpler to do the install. And again, all the ISOs were in dmz-server slash ISO. And the file system trees were in dmz-server slash install, for example, slash 11-SP1 underscore x86 slash cd1. So that's where you're going to find your installation source. Now, I'm curious to see how things go with four systems installing off a of DMC server. There are times where I simply move the ISO local to my system, put them in root or something, and then use them as my repository. Trouble is, it takes disk space, and I have to move things around. So I don't know how busy the NFS server will get versus just moving the ISO straight to your root. So the installer choices. This class is meant to be bare-bone survival, so it's the intent that you install with the ASCII end curses version. So you're going to go into UVCon to get the serial console. So this would be for non-Unix, non-X11 type of environments. Good for long distance and slow networks. Man, I tried to use uh, YAS2. I'm sitting at home in Minnesota. My equipment is 100 miles away in Wisconsin. I'm on a cable modem. And I can use VNC Viewer and SSH. But if I SSH-X capital in and try to use YAS2, it's too slow. I can't use it. I may have a three-minute wait on a click, and then I've got five clicks ticked off, and it may take me five, ten minutes for the GUI to catch up to me. So I am a person that generally avoids using the YAST GUI, unless the only reason I use it is if my serial port connection is corrupting my screens and I can't use the screens. I have a NAS server, an x86XE system, where the YAST is unusable. I had to use a GUI. The other option, if I was in the same room, was graphical through the VGA console. 
or graphical via SSH, that's the one that I would avoid over long distances. But the advantage is, is there are problems. For example, when I was installing ISSP and it was hung on PCP storage network stuff, I could SSH in with a second window and then kill the stuff off. So SSH does have the ability of uh, multiple sessions logging in to troubleshoot, debug, monitor, run top, stuff like that. But when I was building this uh, NAS server, SSH was too slow, so I went to a VNC viewer. Now, VNC viewer on Linux, or there is a VNC viewer for Windows. I've not used that one yet. And I'm trying to use a Java-enabled browser. And we'll see how that goes. I don't exactly like the Java-enabled browser. Cut and pasting and, and keystroke stuff like that can get into trouble, too. So VNC Viewer is what I prefer. But again, I only use Windows when I'm presenting these WebEx classes. And all our YAX screens. Again, none of this is done if you are using SMN. With that one, you just uh, network boot the node, and then it finds the SMN DHCP server on the ETH1 subnet, not the public net. So decide on your installation method. You may try installing ASCII and then find the screens are too corrupted, too mangled to be readable. Now, for your information, in case you didn't know this, CNTL-L, or CNTL-L, Control L will repaint your YAS screen. But that doesn't always clean it up either. The other thing you want to know are your NICs and the MAC addresses for the mix, because you're going to be wanting to watch the IP address or the, the MAC being presented to a DHCP server. And also choose your system disk. If you have uh, IS-220s attached or something like that, they might show up as SDA and SDB. Make sure you know the serial number of the disk that you're going to boot from, referred to as the device ID. I'll show you that serial number later. And again, we're going to install on SDA, and SDB is going to be used later in the week for XFS routes, cloning routes, XVM, stuff like that. So you're going to install on A for this class, and don't put anything on B. So this is just kind of a drawing showing that we've got SMNs here with this VLAN SMN that I mentioned. There's a VLAN local for the CMCs, which showing the public on the left. And then they've got a node BMC showing here. And there are actually uh, demons that communicate between the CMC and the SMN. There's a CMCD and an SMND. And then we've also got a uh, base I.O. module visible here as well. So to boot the system to EFI, I'm going to connect in. Again, the uh, format is a UTF-8. Now you have to be a little careful here. Uh, in slots 11, some of the YAS screens are more than 22 lines. So like in the repository screen, I actually need 24 lines. So sometimes I'll grab the bottom of the window, pull down, and then control L to repaint the screen. So sometimes you might not see the finish or the next or the accept button. But in those cases, usually the F10 type of key will work, unless that F10 is being intercepted by your, your desktop manager, like Windows or something. So if I log into the SMN, I can then log into the CMC, and it's just been called CMC1. And again, this is obsolete here. The CLI bin is gone not there anymore. So take that out. Unless it is there. If it is there, that's the one you want. But it's now in Cisco bin. It's been moved. And it's in the same place on the SMN as it is on the CMC. And then you're going to grab your serial console. Now I'll demonstrate this in a few minutes. So here, I've logged in to Floyd-CMC. 
I've already given you a root password. Then on the CMC login prompt, by the way, note my firmware level here. I'm at a 1.0.5 now. This is when the CMC or the power command changed. So now no more CLI bin. Hey, Dave. Yeah. You're running 1.2.0. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the, at 1.0.5, the CLI stuff still exists. Yeah, so this is a little older screen. You're right, thank you. So it's 1.2, and that was the one that we picked up the new power command. Now, I had chosen to leave some of these older slides here in case somebody is actually using the presentation without me and uh, to avoid the confusion on this power command. So I kind of wanted the older slides to just point it out. Okay? So yeah, you said it was a 1.2? One, one was that right? Yeah, that's what your uh, CMC shows anyway. Yep, no, that's fine. I'll check that in a minute. And, uh, in the lab, you'll actually probably have two windows, one to do power and status, and then the other one to watch the console. So again, I've given you each one of you your... Uh, Partition number, so uh, Dimitri is going to be in partition one. And then for simplicity, I am logging in the first time with a steal to take the console away from somebody else or maybe another session of mine. And I'm also clearing out all the old logs. So these are not required. This is just the way I'm going to start off to start off clean. Okay. At that point, then I'm going to sit there. And I'm going to show this. We're going to sit there and wait. So when I came in, this was all the older stuff. This is probably the reset that was just done. And it says end of cache output. So at this point on, I'm going to be waiting for stuff to happen. Now, there are these things happening on the individual blades? We're looking at the serial console, not the individual blades. So there is a NumaLink discovery process on the individual blades. You might have a third window logged in just to watch B0 and B1 boot before you get the serial console. So once I've gotten that console, I'm going to wait for this. This is the big thing. And it may take a couple of minutes. So here we're seeing, and here's the key thing, I've got to hit a space bar to drop into EFI. Now if I've reflashed my CMC or reflashed my EFI, all the older EFI settings that you're going to do tomorrow will be lost, and the default is to drop to the EFI shell. But if, if we have a default boot already configured, I'm going to have to hit the space bar to drop into the, into the EFI menu. So a, a few minutes later, I then, because I hit the space bar, and it doesn't always acknowledge that it saw your keystroke, you are then dropped into the EFI menu. This is a little different than you had on Titanium, but is is easy enough to uh, convert your map between the two. So you're going to down arrow to the boot manager because we want to boot off the network. So when I'm in the boot manager, this allows me to boot off of different systems. Now in this case, there was still an older root there. But I down arrow to EFI network. That's ETH0. If I'm booting from the SMN, if I want a Pixie boot or Pixie install from the SMN, that would be e EFI network 1. And that is going to the private subnet for the SMN that a DHCP server on the SMN is running. So I down arrow to EFI network and hit enter, and then I watch the installation ker kernel load. Now what it's telling me, this is not a boot kernel, this is an install kernel. It's not the subject of this class to tell how to set up the DMZ server to do Pixie boots. That's another class. We don't have time for that here. So I've already got DMZ server set up to Pixie boot your Floyds on ETH0 of each Floyd. So after the kernel has brought up, you will then be at this screen. Now I need to be able to do rescue mode as well. So I have it set up as a minimal boot 
with no options other than what are critical like console equals. So it's what we usually refer to as a manual install. But at this point, again, I'm not pointing to a install equals path, so it's asking for a CD. And I don't have a CD, so I tab to back and then hit enter. And now I'm at a language screen, and I'm going to select English. And then I'm at a start installation screen. Again, I'm calling this manual installation. And then I hit, again, hit start installation, and it goes to network, or actually it was on DVD, and I down arrow to network and hit OK. And then I've got to put in the IP address of my NFS server. So at this point, we've already got a kernel in, in an RD from DMZ server, but now we have to point to our installation source. And again, all these IP addresses are in the notes underneath, or uh, over the weekend, the PDFs that were generated were slide only with notes at the very end. So I had to regenerate them so that the notes are underneath and synchronized with the screenshots. So again, 192.48.186.79 is DMZ server. And then the path of where the install tree is, install slus 11 sp1 x86. That was all decided by me when I use YAS to build an install server. And again, when you're installing, you've got to point to the top directory of the CD. So I have to have the CD1 there. So at that point, we're into a normal install. Anybody got questions? Any, any comments? So I tab into agree to the license, tab to next. Note, by the way, we have to watch this. I'm not sure. I think it says SLUS 11 SP1 now, not SLUS 11. This might be an older screenshot. I'll have to look at that. Then we get a media check. Now, if you're not installing from a DVD, you will not see this screen. If I'm installing from a DVD, then you will see it. So I just left it there, but you will not see the screenshot. Then I go into installation mode. So I want to do a new installation. Uh, UVs were never supported on SLUS 11, so there should be no reason to do an update. Also, I am not doing an add-on products right now because I want to keep it simplistic in my initial install. But if I was trying to generate an auto YAS file, I might then tick that box and add the add-on products right away. But remember, if I do that, i got to make sure that PCP storage is not being installed because it will hang trying to initialize itself to a network that isn't completely there yet. So I just always like to get SLES installed and then lay the other things on top unless I'm trying to get an AutoYAS file. And there is another way to get an AutoYAS file. That is to uh, install everything and then reset the system to go back to a first boot. I will show you how to do that. So when you're done installing ProPack, or I should say Performance Suite, and all the extra RPMs that you want, at some point you say, okay, now let me generate an AutoYAS file. I'll show you that. So I'm not using the add-on right now because I want to get through a simplistic install. I don't want to have to be 45 minutes into the install and then have a problem. So then I'm uh, going to the clock and time zone. I prefer everybody to use central time zone, which is where the equipment is. I uh, prefer you not use uh, your own time zone. Use the time zone the equipment's in. And double check, make sure your clock is right to begin with. We've been having some problems. I've got to actually get it to uh, uh, NTP. I just haven't added anything to do a network time protocol synchronization. Then we're going to get a uh, virtualization screen. We are not using virtualization here right now. So we're just doing a physical machine. Tab to next. And then we're at the main installation settings screen.
So I tab down. It's kind of hard to see underneath here, but there's a little button box down here called uh, Change. I can tab into the box, or in my case, I tab to Change and hit Enter. I want to do partitioning, and I want to do software. So I've gone into the partitioning, and I have to prepare, see what disk drives I have. I'm going into custom partitioning, and then next. And now I'm at this partitioner screen. Now, I don't know if you've worked with SLES 11 yet, but this has changed quite a bit from SLES 10. So in this case, I had to tab into here, and then I used a plus sign to expand the drives that were visible on my system. And then I tab down to SDA, and now I can see, basically I can see both still, SDA and SDB. Now again, this is not necessarily the way engineering is going to ship or anything like that. Uh, and SMN is not going to have a FAT, so I have a FAT file system to be able to boot. Then I have my root file system. Then I have a swap slice. And then I have a data one and X extra. And note in this example, they're both EXT examples. I might in the future want to make one of these XFS, for example. So don't take don't take the labs too literally right now, but I'm going to want an extended three and an XFS root here. Uh, the labs are being maintained by somebody else, and then I clean them up over the weekend. And uh, I'm going to be making a lot of changes during the week, so don't be afraid that this is the first time you're running the labs. This is the first time we're using the materials, and this is the first time on virtual. So send me email if there's any questions, typos, anything that you don't like, any inconsistencies you find, like... Uh, whoever it was, Richard or whoever, that warned me about the problem level. Okay. So I want to install an SDA. There will be directions in there for sizes, but I typically use 500 meg for a FAT. I want at least uh, 30 gig for a root, and I want like uh, 1 gig for a swap. Now in this case, it kind of went 90, 32 with a 9 gig swap. But again, that's all going to be something that you can decide on your own. Engineering, or I should say manufacturing, because these drives are so big, will create an extra partition here. They usually mount it as data one or something like that. So that's why there's a fourth partition there. And that prevents root from filling up from data one, but they're not mounting data one to do anything with it. For example, it's not being mounted as temp or bar temp or slash home. It's just being mounted as data one. Also, it's not in the lab, but I do have a NAS NFS server if you want to add that for home directories. It's just called NAS-server. And I have home directories, I have NFS and NIS set up there. But this class, this lab right now is not written to use that. But in the real world we do. So if you want to play with that on your own, there's TNG1 through TNG10, there's guest, stuff like that, all out on NAS-Server. And it is running the latest ISSP software. So it's also running SLES 11 SP1 with ISSP 2.2, I think it was, for the October release. Any questions right now? So in this example, we also went into default settings to see what the default is, and extended three is the default root, and we're going to mount devices by name. Okay, and somewhere in the lab, we're probably going to want to play with label. Later, we're going to play with UUID. But right now, we're going to mount by ID. I think I said name. We're going to show by name, but we're going to mount by device ID. And let me show you that in a few minutes. 
So in this example now, I'm getting rid of everything there. So I tab down, there is an expert mode that was underneath this button here. Tab down to expert, hit enter, and I want to clobber the drive. This is doing a DD to clear up the drive. Nowadays, if I'm doing DD to clear a drive, you need to clear both the beginning and the end of the drive. And I generally uh, do uh, like 32K byte, both at the beginning and the end of the drive. But by using YAST, I don't have to worry about it. There is LVM information, MD information that's deeper than 16K nowadays. We need to talk about that. Uh, XVM partitions are starting 8K blocks into the drive now to avoid what's called the exclusion zone. I'll come back to that stuff later. So after I cleared it, I now have SDA empty. Now I've got A selected here. I've got A visible here. If I left arrow to overview, I'd be able to see the serial number. So I tap down to add, hit enter, and now I'm going to say, okay, give me a 500 meg. I'm going to do a fat. But again, if I'm doing SMC, I don't have a fat. Don't need it. That's pixie booting. So it said 500 meg for a fat. Then I said format the partition, make it a fat. And then mounted is Boot EFI. Now those that were familiar with Titanium, Boot EFI was actually an option in that mount point menu when you click down on it. Now that we're on x86, I do not see Boot EFI there. I have to explicitly type it out. Tab to finish. Again, we have, we, we're not starting the install yet. We're just setting up configuration. Now, I've skipped some screenshots here, but now I've gone into custom size 2 gig for my swap. So I'm trying to do a 2 gig swap as my second partition. And then I've configured it as swap and mounted it as swap. And then hit finish. The third one now I've done is root. And again, I've skipped some screenshots, but now I've gone in and I've set up, the way I was doing it is about 60 gig for for root and 60 gig for data one. That seemed to be best for me. I don't want too big a root. I don't want things on root filling up root. So anyways, I, I typically advise at least 30 gig. I mean, you can get by with a 10 gig root, but I usually say minimum 30 gig for breathing room. In this case, I've gone 60 gig. By the way, for swap size, generally it's not going to be physical memory. It's going to be what you need for a dump. Or if you are doing PBS Pro job preemption, where processes are being suspended and pushed out to swap, then you might need a bigger swap. So I traditionally start off as a 2 gig swap by default. But nowadays with 500 gig roots, we can have a bigger swap too. So I chose a 60 gig root, and then uh, chose it extended three because that's the way the factory is doing it. If you want to do it as XFS, that's your choice. And then I'm mounting it as slash. Okay. Now also I didn't show it here, but I tabbed into FS tab options down here. Hit enter on that one. And now I've got all these things. So I went in and actually created and said I'm going to mount my root by label. And then I stuck in a label. The default might be by ID. Remember earlier we saw the default was to do it by ID. The ID is essentially the serial number of the drive. And if you have failover, alternative paths, you might have that drive show up multiple times but they'll still have the same serial number. We try to avoid device name because that's not persistent. If I lose a drive and reboot, all my device namings can be shifting. And device path is just kind of long, so we don't use device path too often. Any questions? Engineering nowadays is doing everything by label or by ID. We no longer do things by name. 
And I'll explain that when we get into device naming uh, probably tomorrow afternoon or first thing Wednesday. So basically I took whatever else was left on the drive for my slash data one. Now you could mount it as home instead of data one or temp or var temp or var spool. But uh, I think data one is the way the lab is going to be written. And again, I, I'm primarily going to want home to be an NFS mount. So it makes more sense for me to mount, mount data one as temp or var temp. Okay, so tap down to next, hit enter. Uh, I'm having the data one let, uh, file system be made as XFS. And then here I mounted it as data one. So that's the way the lab's being written, but you can modify that somewhat if you want. I do want it to be XFS so that we can clone it, so we can back it up and stuff. Tab to finish and hit enter. So I now am back into my final partitioning, and notice I've got Fs here for formatting. Sizes look okay, 500 meg, 2 gig, 60 gig, 74 gig. It works for me. And they all, all formatted and then check that it's fat, swap, extended, and XFS. Check that field too. Okay? And then hit accept. Now it's going to complain the label type is GPT. We are using GPTs. And it kind of goes along by the fact that we have EFI as well. So change our partitioning? No, I want to keep a GPT partition table. Okay. After the partitioning is done, I've skipped a screenshot, but now we're into software management. And we're going to tab to this filter screen here and then hit the down arrow and then up arrow to the patterns. And in particular, then I'm going to tab down. I want to select the C compiler group. And when I get down to there, I will actually see the packages that are part of that group. Hit a plus sign to add it as an install. Now this does not include Fortran. Once I hit enter, it's going to tell me I've got all these uh, dependencies. So I just hit OK. Then I'm also doing one more thing. I'm going back to filter, down arrow, up arrow to get to search, and I'm searching for a package called perf. Now perf is an important package for you to load. It, it will give me, for example, perf top will tell me what I'm doing when I have high system time. So perf is the Linux profiling tool now. Essentially, to me, it replaces profile.pl. Profile.pl from ProPack is gone. So uh, I spent a lot of time in the UV system analysis class on this package, but perf space top is a handy tool. Tab to accept. So basically, I've modified my partition table. I've modified my patterns, and I've added an individual package. So now I'm ready to do an install. Now you can tab down and see everything that it's going to do. But I basically tab to install, hit enter, and now it says, do you really want to install? If I rebooted right now, my old root is intact. Once I hit install, my root has been reformatted. A parted and make FS are being done right away. So everything up till now, my other root is still intact in case I made a mistake. Once I hit this install button, uh, it's gone. I will not be able to recover those prior partitions. Any questions or comments? So at this point, you're going to be waiting for about a half hour, maybe more. Don't know how much contention there will be between four servers going to the DMZ server for installation. So uh, if you want to time it and let me know how long it takes, go ahead. And by the way, if I was to run this with a GUI, with SSH, refreshing the GUI across a slow network, 
has taken my install into the hours as it's trying to because it's synchronizing the uh, the GUI YAST on my desktop through a cable modem and that slows down the install significantly. So uh, again, I do not want to use SSH capital X to get to my installer. The VNC will be faster, significantly faster. So at this point, your root has been overwritten and it is reloading packages. Then we get, when it's done, we get to what's called first boot. So between 250 and 251, a system reboot occurred. We are now in the uh, first boot configuration stuff. Now, if you look at your notes underneath, it tells you how to get first boot again. Sometimes students will screw up and uh, break out in the middle of first boot and it never finishes, or they forget to do first boot, and there's no uh, root password and things like that. So what you can do is create that one file. Down at the bottom, there's, there's a touch of a file, and you also have to reload YAS2 first boot. And then when you reboot, you will be back into a first boot situation. So maybe I've built my route, I've built everything, and now I'm ready to send it off to a customer site. So I might set it up for first boot so that when they boot it the first time, they can automatically select their root password and network settings and stuff like that. And also get an auto YAST file on that first boot. Okay. I don't have the notes underneath, but there's a touch of a file, a, a run me file in, for YAS to pick up and load the YAS2 first boot RPM, reboot, and you'll be back into first boot. I did try it a couple weeks ago to make sure that it works. So I want us to stick to SGI, SGI as our password. Again, guest will be a password of guest. TNG01 will have a password of TNG01. Uh, only the CMC has a password I cannot change. And we've already discussed the root password for the CMC. So after that, we then get into the domain name. Now, our domain is just SGI.com. At one point, I wanted it to be TNGSGI.com, but the other people involved never did that. And this makes it uh, short and quick. So we do not have our own DMZ. I deselect the change host name. And for those that were used to this one, don't do this anymore. It assigns my IP, it assigns my host name to 127.0.0.2. And then things like uh, ESP and Gangly and stuff that need the host name aren't getting a public IP host name, they're getting the loopback IP. And that's been giving me lots of problems. So in the past, I always did an assigned host name to loopback IP. <coughs> but now it's, its behavior is different. And it's giving me a 127.0.0.2 to floyd1.sgi.com. And I don't want that. Okay? So have both of those deselected. By the way, on an SMN SMC situation, it is the Pixie boot server that is assigning the host name. So what you can do in that situation is after you've imaged things is to assign your host name, deselect this, and then give it a static IP through YAST, or give it a static host name through YAST. By default, the SMN gives a serial number for the host name. So then I'm into the network configuration. I'm going to tab the firewall and note I have disabled the firewall in this example. So again, somebody, uh, uh, Richard had Floyd 4 that had a firewall up. IP tables dash capital L showed that there was a firewall up. And then I went into YAST, security, stopped the firewall, and then was able to log in, I hope. So I kind of like to flip, for me it's easier to put up firewalls and to take them down, but I usually start off with the firewalls disabled. 
then I'm into the network configuration screen. I've tapped down. There's a little button underneath here. And I've hit that and gone into network interfaces. So now I'm into this one. This is again changed from SLUS 11 to from SLUS 10 to SLUS 11. So you got to remember to do these things. A lot of people forget this stuff. So you want to try to get it right the first time. You can always redo it as long as you can get your system booted through the serial console. So again, this is ETH0 and then ETH1 we're ignoring. In fact, I'm leaving it not configured right now. The, the SMN is probably not even ready to image this thing. So if the SMN doesn't know about it, the DHCP could take time. And again, note my max. I don't know if it's underneath this slide or the next slide. All the IP address and MAC IPs are documented in the lab manual and in the notes underneath. So Floyd 1 is actually a .111 IP address. So I would tab to edit. And here now I'm in uh, filled in with a 1.111, normal net mask, and then I put in my host name. Now be very careful here. I don't know what's going on, but in the past couple of weeks I've been seeing the domain name twice. So I'm seeing .sgi.com, .sgi.com twice. And I don't know where that's coming from, whether the DHCP server is giving me it and then I'm adding it in. So I'm not even sure that I should have this fully qualified here. Okay? So watch for that problem. I need to find out what exactly is causing that. Okay, so after that, then I have gone back to the other screen, but now I've left arrow to get to the DNS. Again, message of the day on DMZ-server gives all network information. But here I've got my IP, SGI. Ooh, I want to deselect that, get rid of that one. I don't want that screenshot. And then my IP address of the DNS. I'm sorry, yeah, the DNS server and domain search. Again, if I assign host name to loopback, I'm going to get floyd1.sgi.com to have an IP address of 127.0.0.2, and that will break things. Okay? Then I'm going to do routing 192.148.186.1. That's our gateway out. After the networks are configured, I kind of did the OK and the next, moved on. And I personally do like to test the internet connection. If everything was done right, it should work for you and you should be able to get a download. Again, this is a little bit old. That IP address is not right anymore. Also, I'm going to leave it to you as to whether you want to actually configure now or later. The lab manual that I have has you configure the update server now. So I have selected configure now. Usually I will not include anything else. Go to next and hit enter. Then it comes up with this. Now I will hit continue. And then this is the hard part. It may take a while or you may have connectivity problems, but eventually you should get up a W3M browser. Nobody likes that W3M browser either. So I'm going to tab the email address and confirm it. Now, I don't like all the spam that comes from this. We have permission to use susidev at sgi.com as a bit bucket. So that's where all the junk email goes to. So you can stick that one in instead of your own address. So I have to tab to that thing, hit enter, and then a dialog box will come up saying, what text do you want to put in? So you have to get a little used to using W3M in input mode. After I put in my email address, I can get the activation code. Now, 
Uh, send me an email offline. I can give you the activation code or show, show you how to get to it. Jesus Ortega has a web page on getting to the uh, Novell uh, SGI support account as well. You don't actually have to have an activation code. You should be able to get updates for, I think it's 60 days still. But I kind of like to actually register the system and make sure that the registration is working. So uh, don't be afraid to send me email in this area. And then once I've got that stuff done, I do a submit. So it's then going to pop up this screen. All you basically have to do is a Q and a Y. And then at some point it will say successful update server added or something like that. So next screen is for certif certificate for certification. I just use the defaults. <clears throat> Note sometimes you're going to have to have a password in there. In fact, that's one of the problems. People will blow up on first boot, never finish first boot, never do this, and then they have to recreate their certificate. That's usually why I just touch that uh, run me file, load the yes ask to first boot, and then go back to first boot again, make sure everything was done right. And then we do want to add a user just for sanity right now, guest with a password of guest. And then we've got our release notes. Then uh, basic miscellaneous hardware configuration. And then lastly, and here's where we're going to get a auto YAS file for uh, rebuilding this system. We get this installation complete, hit finish, and it will take a little while as it generates an auto YAS file. Okay, any questions? I don't know if we're still here. So, on reboot then. So there is a reboot between 2.69 and 2.70. I usually like to reboot as soon as I've installed SLES to make sure that I can reboot. And I don't want to go on with any other custom changes until I know that I can boot the system. So then I've got my uh, install SGI products. I'm going to do it as an add-on. Now a lot of engineering is just adding them as repositories. I am doing it as an add-on product. If I add it as a repository, it will not show up as an add-on product. You can go ahead and try it either way if you want. It doesn't matter to me. So I get to the add-on screen, tab to add, hit enter. And now here I'm going to go to an NFS. So my DMZ server is going to be my NFS. And then I've got, I'm going to mark, here's my IP address of the DMZ server. Here's the path. You can log in and cut and paste, or just type it out. And the first thing I'm adding is the SDK. And note I've also marked that it's an ISO image. Browse, by the way, doesn't do anything. It just tells you what file systems are mounted when it's NFS. If it's a lo local file system, browse will show you, show you files. But if I try to browse off this NFS server, it, it won't actually give me file names. So I do have to cut and paste or type it out. Now with the SDK, I have to acknowledge the license agreement. Tab to next, hit enter. And what I want you to do then, I don't think it's visible here. You're going to get into a uh, package manager. Let me go back up two screenshots. Uh, there's this thing down here, run software manager. So at some point you're going to be into the software manager. What I want you to do is tab up to filter, down arrow and get to search, and then we want to load GCC-Fortran. Fortran compilers are now on the SDK. They are not on the SLES distribution. Tab to accept and hit enter, resolve any dependencies. And then when you're done, I can now see 
then it got less added. Okay. In fact, we can even see that it's off as a uh, NFS server. After the SDK, again in ISO PS 1.0 is my foundation ISO. I've ticked it to ISO image and selected next. And now because it's a uh, SGI, I have to import the PGB key. So the GPG key will be imported after this. And then here's the pane. These are not actually going to be available yet. This is, in fact, an old path here. So you, even if you have a uh, username and a password, the paths are not in place yet because we're in pre-release. This would be your support folio account and support folio password. If you don't have one, I can give you one. And then tab continue. If I don't put this stuff, it's going to be prompting me. This stuff can get very noisy and annoying as it keeps prompting you for this information. So after I did that and put in the proper authentication, I then tap to the software manager tab to patterns, scroll down, and we now have some SGI patterns that were added. And I've actually gone down to one and can see what's actually being installed and what is in each of these uh, patterns. A tab to accept, and then I've skipped some screenshots. So the third piece, I've added the SDK and the SFS foundation software. Now I'm adding the MPI software. Again, it's an ISO, tab to next, and hit enter. And now I've actually gone into the package manager, and we see with SP, SGI MPI that we've got things like MPI inside. Now there's a new feature here for checkpointing, Berkeley Checkpoint Restart. That's a new feature. It's not selected by default. But if you want to select it, go ahead. I've installed it, but I've not actually used it yet. And then the last package was Accelerate. And again, tick it as an ISO, hit Next. And I also went into Accelerate to show the packages that are in there. We will talk about the global reference unit later, but that's really another class subject. So at that point, I'm done with oh, one more, XVM 6.2, tick it as ISO, and hit Next. And then it's just showing what's in the package. So it does have the LK stuff, it has PCP stuff, things of that sort. It does not have the GUIs. I should say it does not have the CXFS X manager, XVM manager GUIs. So now that we're all done, I've got one, two, three, four, five distributions, five add-on products that have been added. Tab to OK. I'm kind of done here. So at that point then, I'm done. After I'm done with my system, I might reboot to make sure you really do want to reboot after performance suite has been loaded to pick up the SGI kernel modules and to make sure that you can reboot. Then after reboot, I want you to check to see what release you've got running. Check your kernel. Use RPM QA dash dash last to see what got loaded. We're going to have to talk about zipper in the next module, but zipper is a layer on top of RPM, and this is giving me patch information. I want to do DF to see what file systems I've got mounted. I want to check my networks. I want to check my PCI devices. And again, check that I can reboot. So here was an example. SUSE dash release should give me 11.1. Then I catted SGI dash asterisk. Here's my accelerate, my foundation, my MPI, my XVM. And they do still have a ProPack marking in there. And then my uname. This is the default kernel. We do not notice the number one. We do not want a default kernel. I'm going to talk about this in the next module. But we are at PTF number three. And I will 
tell you where the PTF kernel is and stuff. And another quick check was the topology command. Another new tool, if you haven't seen this yet, is SAM, Supportability Analysis Module. It's kind of like the old SPIDENT, S-P-I-DENT command that we had in SLES 10. So it's another good inventory tool. It tells you what RPMs are loaded, what distributions are loaded, all that sort of information. And then various additional information. So are we still there? Any questions right now? Nope. So I am going to uh, start off here. Actually, I'm going to get, uh, let me do three windows here. So I am on to the CMC for this example. I'm just going to start with one of the systems. And again, a UV config-v to show me, oops, config-v to show me that all my blades are there and all my partitions are there. If I were to take a power hit or something like that, they might be in the process, or resetting them, they might be in the process of rebooting. HWCFG-v for verbose shows me the blades that are in each partition. Now, Dimitri, I'm just going to step on partition one. Okay. Now, partition one does have a base I.O. blade, so to watch this, I'm going to do a UV con on R1, I1, B0. I do not need the, the zero blanks. And all kinds of stuff there. Again, escape, uh, control four breaks me out. I'm going to do this again with a dash dash clear. Notice it did not clear at that time. I'm going to do an escape and do it again. And now I can see when I connected that it's been cleared. There's no cached console output. Okay. The other command, I'm going to go in and do UV con on dash dash steel, dash dash clear on P1. And again, I'm just going to escape and do that again. And now I see that I've got a clear and everything's clean. Okay? Now I'm just curious here. I'm going to try the power command. First of all, before I do that, so we were talking about before, there's my rev level now. 1.2 is what it looks like I'm at here. I'm going to do a show BIOS. So that's a release 1.24, basically. And uh, those that know uh, uh, Paul Pedersen, he's the one that's been flashing and giving me the latest uh, firmware here. There's also a CMC version, which will run the CMC command, will run the version command on all CMCs. I only have one CMC here. And again, it shows me 1.2. I can run a BMC command, and that will run the command on all the BMCs. So there now, I did a BMC command, and I can see from each BMC what their blade name is or their host name is. Okay? I'm also going to try a witch power. So Cisco bin power is the new place for the power command. There is no CLI 
directory anymore. Power dash dash help. No man pages, but there we can get. So let's see what happens here. Power without anything gave me status. So I have eight blades on, none that are off, none that are unknown or turned up, disabled, and one CMC that's on. Okay? So I'm going to do a power status on P1, see what that does. And again, just for that partition one is telling me what's on and what's not on. So all four of these nodes are going to be rebuilt today. So I'm just going to start that now. I'm going to do a power reset. Now let's time this and see how long it takes, P1. So over on the left, we should start seeing BMC stuff happening. There, we just saw a reset occur. And wait for it over here as well. I'm kind of watching the clock here, too, just to time this. Okay, so there we've got some cold resets showing up. And now we've got the initial blade booting. So this is uh, discovery of the blade. This is BIOS basically starting. There was some uh, quick path interconnect stuff. It's testing the blade. All the other the other blade is going to be doing something as well, but I did not actually uh, attach to it. Let me just try that here. You need con uh, R1, I1, B1. So it's running a memory test right now. Now at some point, oh, by the way, let me get out of here for a second. Escape Control 4. Uh, the BIOS command, dash S, is very useful here to tell you what's happening in each of the blades. So here I can see uh, two of my blades, they're basically going through the initialization process. BIOS dash S, so now it's in NumaLink routing. So over here it looks like it should be doing some new link discovery. So I'm just watching with BIOS-S in the lower right corner while that blade is booting. Looks like it's in PCI discovery. No, my console is not doing anything yet. What we hope not to see here, by the way, is a cat error. There, now. We now are hit there. I'm going to hit the space bar. Note that it did not give me a response yet. I'm going to go down here and do a BIOS again. So it looks like it's in VGA connecting right now. And there, we are now down into EFI. Let me just do a BIOS here. So we see one that's booting, one that's sleeping, waiting for handoff. That's the second blade waiting for the first blade to, to join in the, on the first blade. Any questions right now? So I've got EFI up now. I had to hit the space bar to drop into it. I could have dropped into EFI, but in this case I did not. I had hit the space bar in time. So now I'm going to go down to Boot Manager. And I want to boot off EFI Network. That's, and we can see the MAC over here, C2B0. That's the one that's attached to the public subnet. And DMZ server is listening on that 192.48.186 subnet. So I'm going to hit Enter. And it got this kernel from DMZ-Server. If I'd logged into DMZ-Server and did a tail-f, 
on bar log messages, I'd be able to see that stuff. We now have a kernel booting. I'm going to go down here and do the BIOS. Okay. And we're pretty much done with the, the blade stuff. So I'm going to do it a control F to get out of there. I'm going to take a break here in a few minutes. Again, when I'm done with the uh, lecture, I'm hoping to finish up in another uh, hour. When I'm done with lecture, you're going to be doing the labs for the modules that I covered today. By the way, I never did time it, 36 to 41. It's been five minutes now since I did the power. But I didn't time how long the actual, uh, how long it took to get to the EFI shell. That's why some people will like to log into the, the first blade of the partition and watch the blade come up. If you do get into CAD errors, you're probably going to do a, have to do a power off P1, power on P1, power reset. Question? Do you know if the new BIOS fixed? Uh, well, there were a lot of problems with partitioning back, um, I don't know, a couple months ago when I took the hardware class. And yeah. That's what we're hoping. This is actually a pristine environment. Well, definitely the, 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 the reset fencing isn't... Um, didn't seem to be operational, and you'd find your noted cat error. Yeah, uh -huh. well, there are a variety of issues. Uh, there is a news list UV bring up. So, yeah, Paul upgraded my BIOS and my firmware about a week ago to, to get us to this new pristine BIOS level. And it, when that happens, your power command is in this new Cisco bin location. Got it. But any new PVs I, I can't address anything that I haven't seen yet, okay? But yeah, I'm hoping that it resolves the partitioning issues that we've been dealing with in class. Anything else? So again, off of DMZ-server, I'm just doing a bare bone uh, boot. So I gotta do a back, hit English, start installation. Now I can drop into expert mode and poke around. And then I can I'll go into later in the week, we're going to go into rescue mode. So there's my rescue mode to fix my route, for example. So I'm going to start the installation. I'm going to go to network. I'm going to go to NFS. I'm going to be on ETH0. That's the one that's going to the public network. ETH1 goes to the SMN and is a private maintenance subnet. Uh, Automatic configuration versus via DHCP. You could probably do yes, but I want to do no just to walk through it. So my IP address is going to be in the workbook and also in ITSI hosts on the uh, DMZ server, or you should be able to ping it. It's in house DMS. I'm on Floyd 1, so it should be 111, default subnet mask. Uh, I don't really need an IP address for the gateway at this point. I'll leave that alone. Don't need domain searches. I'll leave that alone right now. Now the IP address of the uh, DMZ server, 192.48.186.79. That's fine. Notice somebody came in and is spying on me. That's okay. By the way, Control L. Nope, didn't work here. IP address of the NFS server. Let me try it again. 192.48.186.79. The directory on the server. Again, this is all in the lab procedures and in the notes underneath. Install slash 11. Uh, dash SP1 underscore x86 
slash CD1. And again, that path will be unique depending upon how a, DM, a Pixie boot server has been configured. And now it has actually gone off to that uh, DMC server and is pulling in the installation system, all the YAST and stuff like that. Uh, no new driver updates found. We don't have to explicitly specify INS mods for de device drivers for Ethernet or anything like that here. And I'm now in. I'm going to tab to I agree. And again, control L. I'm hoping that you can get a clean screen here. So I'm using putty on a normal Windows. Uh, yeah, that's what that's why I was spying your console, because on IRIX I'm using an XW uh, yeah, XWSH and it's just almost unreal. What's IRIX? Oh, oh okay. XWSH yep, again. Uh, I'm hoping that you can get a clean screen. I have it on my Mac now, it's clean. Yeah. So I'm hoping you can get a clean screen. I can go in and change the elilo.conf on DMZ server to do VNC equals one, but then everyone else would have to pick that up. And the intent here is to be able to do it at this low level. Yeah, yeah. Because there are times you have to do it this way, and that's the only reason I'm doing it this way. Uh, Temple, for example, you only have the ASCII YAST. So if anybody uh, gets to this point, this part might get corrupted. Control L will repaint it. And if that doesn't work, send me email and we'll go from there. But putty and Xterm, and if you're using like Hyper Terminal or some of those things, you might have to be in a UTF-8 format, that sort of thing. Okay, and I am avoiding X11 for performance reasons too. Any other questions? I am right on the hour. I'm going to take a 15-minute break here. Then we'll go back to the next module. We got setup and we got hardware to cover. Okay? Yep. Let's take a 15-minute break. And Dimitri, you can have your uh, system back now. Okay. I'm not going to do anything more with that one. So everyone can at, at least uh, get to their serial console for their partition. So we'll see you in 15 minutes.
Hello, are we back? Yeah. Sure. 